G'day Fools, I'm Scott Phillips, the Motley Fools CIO here in Australia, and welcome to Motley Fool Stock of the Week, our flagship YouTube series. We release to you every single Wednesday on YouTube and on the Motley Fool Money podcast. Thank you for joining us for another episode. We hope you're enjoying them. We hope you will enjoy plenty more, including this one. Now, before I get going, my usual intro, I need to remind you this is general advice, not personal advice. We can't tell you what you should do, only what we think about the company and let you decide whether it's right for you. Secondly, we're long-term investors. We make no predictions. We have no idea what's happening over the next hour, day, week, month, or even year when it comes to share prices. We're focused on the three to five year horizon. Maybe even more relevant today, potentially. Stand by for that than it is normally. And of course, we're recording this one uh, roughly the middle, early, early uh, 9th of November. So we're recording this one early in November 2021. If you're watching this or listening to this subsequently, a few may have changed. Andrew may have changed his mind on the company we're talking about for good or for ill. It could be price, could be quality, or maybe he hasn't changed his mind at all. But just bear that in mind if you're looking at this subsequently. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So all we can tell you is our thoughts on today, this recording day, when it goes live tomorrow on the 10th of November. So with that, welcome to Andrew Leggett. How are you, mate? Hey, Scott. How are you going? Mate, I'm exceptionally well. You are bringing... When well, you're bringing a Star Wars company to us, I'm sure you're going to do a much better job, but all I have is visions of of Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, or maybe it's Star Trek with the Klingons and the Federation. I'm not sure which sci-fi, you can tell I'm not very into sci-fi, I love my Star Trek, but I'm not a big, sci- not a big fan of some of the more obscure sci-fi titles. This is not science fiction, this is kind of science fact, at least in theory, but I do believe there are lasers involved. The company, of course, is Electro Optic Systems, which tells me almost nothing, but probably tells you more. The ASX code is EOS. Mate, let's just kick it off by by getting out of my horrible, horrible, I'm sure, distracting analogies and examples and science fiction references. What does electro-optic systems actually do? Well, instead of Star Wars, I was going to say like the Australian listed company that's most likely to appear in a Bond film. but um, (laughs) That far away. Because there's, there's kind of two... Two main divisions to uh, electro optic systems, which I will just call EOS for for few, you know to save us all some time. Uh, so there is this space division. So that's the Star Wars element, and you know they do a bunch of stuff with uh, space lasers, which sounds pretty cool. Um, you know they they do space de- space debris management. Uh, they do some R and D through there that can lead to other products and things like that. But they also have a, a company called EM Solutions, which is a a leading provider of uh, satellite communication maritime technology. Um, but probably the biggest business in this section is um, it's actually just really in its infancy, which is called Spacelink, which is, you know, to kind of put it mildly, it's kind of like a Wi-Fi uh, system in mid-Earth orbit so that all the satellites in low Earth orbit can can like communicate with ground bases far, far easier. Now, like I said, really early days on that. Um, they've only just signed a uh, a contract for its first ever for the construction of said satellite, so they haven't even been launched yet. But um, that's kind of you know the main business in the space systems. And then we'll get to the you know what we'll call it the Bond division, um, which is the defense systems. Uh, so here, you know, this is their ma- main division. This is their legacy business and their main bread and butter where they make most of their revenue and all of their profit uh, because the space division, they they forced themselves to run it at kind of break even, but it's not generating a lot of profit. Mm-hmm. Um, so, But in the defense systems, they manufacture a whole bunch of stuff, uh, remote weapon systems, uh, gun, you know, turrets that can be placed on top of military vehicles uh, and, you know, handled and, and moved around remotely so, you know, people don't have to be in the line of fire. Uh, they do, you know, com- communications and computing technology. I think, you know, I think the term is C4 or something like that because there's like four Cs, but essentially uh, that's what it is. Right. Um, also, two of their more emerging businesses now. Um, so they do a, a big market at the moment and a, a, a popular one is uh, counter drone and direct energy systems. So uh, kind of, you know, weaponry or other ter- other ways of making sure, you know, any threat posed by a drone can be dealt with. Um, they're also getting into missile systems. Um, that's a relatively new new one as well. But 
Um, so that's the bond division. So just to sum it all up, they do, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, it's obviously a defense business um, and everything has a defense aspect to it, even the space division. But yeah, so most of their money is coming from remote weapon systems and other defense technologies, but they've also got a huge amount of stuff happening in the future that's going to be happening in space, which um, I think is one of the you know big trends that people are talking about lately. I, I don't know about Bond. I, I, in my head, all I can all I can see, I've, I've got the bald head. I'll do the fingers. They do the space laser thing, <laughs> Doctor Evil style. I'm seeing Austin Powers, mate. I'm seeing the volcano kind of move aside on big new mower, big hydraulic wheels, where the, the, the missiles poke out the top or something. It sounds absolutely like, if not a James Bond movie, an Austin Powers flick of some description. Got all the bits and pieces. It only needs the um, the anonymous people walking around in brown uniforms, and we'd have an absolute either. Austin Powers or James Bond movie, of course. Austin Powers based on Bond, at least, at least a little bit. Um, mate, let's um, let's let's get out of again pop culture back to the company itself because these are real, these are real needs, real opportunities. I'm guessing there won't be too many ESG investors investing in weapons systems, but the reality is that uh, defense departments around the world need these things. Satellite deployers and operators need these things. I do believe too. It's, is it fair to say that we don't know everything they're doing because some of it is classified uh, with some of their deals with some of the US. Uh, Department of Defense and others, is that is that right? Yeah, this is never going to be a company where you can expect 100% transparency about <laughs> every little thing that they're doing. It's just the nature of this the, is defense, li- the defense business. <laughs> this is literally one of those, I could tell you, but I have to kill you business. They actually mean it, which is important. So uh, it's be- maybe maybe best not to ask. Let, let's move from that. So you've done a great job of summarizing the two businesses. I love the bond division idea. They really should rebrand there just for, just for sheer amusement. Let's go to the investment case because... We're not talking about this company just because it's fun to talk about, just because we get to talk about James Bond and Star Trek, but actually because it's a recommendation of at least one of our Motley Fool services. So it's a stock you like. Let's go to the investment case, mate. Um, obviously, you talk about a future of unmanned uh, vehicles. You talk about you know potentially warfare by robot, robotic means of one description or another, space, the final frontier. Again, a bit of Star Trek reference for everybody. Um, these are potentially big, lucrative areas and where a lot of the world's governments and defense departments in particular want to go for a whole lot of different reasons. So that's kind of clear in itself. Maybe that is the investment case, but maybe you could take us to the investment case specifically. These guys can't be the only ones doing it. They can't have the a lock on the future, but they're potentially part of it. Why exactly do you like Electro-Optic Systems or EOS as a stock to buy from its market beating potential, mate? Okay, so... Uh, you're right. They're not the only people doing a lot of this stuff. And some of them are really, really big companies and much bigger than than EOS. But what mm. I personally like with EOS, with what I've seen, is they've managed to jump into uh, little niches that they think they, they can get a head start on compared to a lot of these other companies. Um, and whether that, that's through acquisitions or whether just, you know, all, organically moving into them, that's what they've kind of done. And um, that's allowed it to, I guess, you know, play ball with some really big heavy hitters. I mean, you know, there's some enormous defense primes out there, uh, which is the term they use for essentially really big defense company. Um, right. But but yeah, so, so that they've done that. And they've also been building strong relationships with uh, weapons manufacturers over the years so that, you know, they can make sure that things that are coming off their, their manufacturing line are able to fit EOS's products in there and the likes like that. So that's there as well. And they've managed to they've managed to combine all this um, and also you know a lot of internal investment to help really fuel some strong growth in the over the years. So in 2015, uh, they were generating around 30 million dollars in revenue, uh, but in 2020 they were 180 million in revenue. Uh, so that's some pretty uh, that's some pretty big growth in a, in a five year. Mm. In a five-year time frame, um, so that kind of shows how it has been an effective operator in in this space, in this really competitive big market. Uh, there's also they also have an order backlog that's about three hundred ninety-seven million dollars at the moment, so far greater than what it earned in revenue in um, twenty twenty, which from contracts that it's been awarded. Um, but if you look at contracts that it hasn't been awarded. Uh, EOS do this thing where they they risk weight all the potential opportunities based on their likelihood of winning the contract. So if you take that figure, uh, that that risk weighted figure of 
potential pipeline in the future, that adds up to $3.1 billion at the moment. So this is showing that there's there's a lot, there's a huge potential market out there, which if it can keep operating as it has, could mean that this company still has a lot of growth uh, ahead of it. Um, and adding, you touched on it earlier, they're targeting two areas, like, like their main focuses at the moment are, are two industries that are potentially massive emerging and important markets in counter drone technology and space. Uh, you know, I've seen figures that place the counter drone market around four and a half billion dollars by 2026. Uh, there, EOS's own forecast is expecting SpaceLink by itself to bring in about five hundred ninety million dollars in revenue by 2026 and generate a return on investment of around thirty percent. They've and they've already signed some contracts to to both start building, but even signed some contracts with potential customers. They've got a uh, they've got a trial coming up with the International Space System, International Space Station. Sorry, um, for example. And there's also some big tailwinds as well, like defense spending. You know, we're optimists, um, but I think we're also realists. And it's as much as we would like the world peace to throw out that kind of term, and you know, everyone to get along. Defense spending's going to be a thing, and I don't think we've seen anything in the last few years to to make us feel that the threat's actually re- receding. And you know, the Australian government, for example, is lately you know, in budgeted for a big increase in uh, spending in defense. And EOS is one of the main Australian defense companies is probably going to take take at least some of that pie. Um, so there's that as so this increased spending by militaries around the world. Um, and let's in EOS's case, we're focused on mainly what they call the five I countries, the US, Australia, Canada, UK, and New Zealand, because um, yeah, I, I, I don't to do business with those countries, you've got to not sell to other countries, just again, the nature of the business. Um, but yeah, there's there's some big opportunity there. And I also, based on comments that the CEO, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ben Green has um, said over the years, it also appears that they've already done a lot of investment to help them take advantage of that. Um, you know, they already believe they have built enough scale in the business to drive growth towards $1 billion in revenue. Um, So that kind of also hints to me that we may also be starting to get to a period in the EOS lifecycle where um, demand for new capital and significant investment may start, you know, reducing, which means that the underlying profitability of the business might start showing up a bit more when it reports in the years ahead. So that's essentially my, my bull case. Uh, you know, big market, good good at taking advantage of, of niches and, you know, already enough uh, in the pipeline to show that there's still some growth ahead. Yeah, so, so growing company, growing market and big order backlog. It's a nice a nice triumvirate of, of uh, opportunities, I think, for EOS. Now, we're going to the risks in a minute. Before I do, uh, I'll do my usual and just share some of our social uh, network, uh, social media uh, opportunities for our listeners and viewers Let's start there. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for doing that. Please do check out the Motley Fool Money podcast. Just simply open your podcast app, look for Motley Fool Money. You'll find we're produced by Listener, L-I-S-T-N-R, uh, Listener Group, uh, the Southern Cross Stereo business that we partner with for Motley Fool Money. And our other podcast, The Good Oil with Scott Phillips. Those two podcasts are well worth your time, I think. I would say that. I'm on them. Uh, but I enjoy the conversations and I figure if I'm enjoying them, hopefully you will too. So please check those out. If you're listening to this on Motley Fool Money, thank you for doing that please make sure you check out The Good Oil and, of course, our YouTube channel. Just simply go to YouTube, look up The Motley Fool Australia. I won't say Google it because you're using YouTube, but either way, uh, The Motley Fool Australia on YouTube is where you'll find it. Please do like and subscribe to that channel so you get notifications of brand new content like this. Uh, unfortunately, you have to watch me, but you also get to watch Andrews. There's, there's positives and negatives, uh, but hopefully you'll enjoy a, you know, a fuller uh, experience when you're watching as well as listening to what we're saying. Again, make sure you do like and subscribe. That way, hit the notification bell too. That way you get notified uh, when new content is out. If you're on the socials, Andrew Leggett is on Twitter, at, funnily enough, Andrew Leggett. Uh, you can follow Andrew, and you should. He's got some really great stuff. He tweeted some stuff already today that I've enjoyed, mate. So nicely done. Uh, do that. If you want to follow me or The Motley Fool, we're both on Twitter and on Insta at TMF Scott P on Twitter and Insta or at The Motley Fool AU on both platforms. If you're on Facebook, 
check out my page, Scott Phillips Money. That's just facebook.com slash Scott Phillips Money. Or check out The Motley Fool's page, simply facebook.com slash The Motley Fool Australia. All right, that's it for the ads. Let's go back to it, mate. The investment case is important. The bull case is really important. It's the why of your recommendation. But whenever we make a recommendation, we recognize things can go wrong. Uh, they happen all the time. Good companies go bad. Bad companies go worse. Sometimes good companies do really, really well. But it's important to know that there are things that can upset an investment. Thieves to be ready for those, to expect them to know they may happen and to know what to do if and when they come to pass. We call it risks and when we'll sell in most of our services. So mate, EOS, big growing business, big blue sky future, or maybe blue, do we say blue space future, dark space future, whatever it is, big future. Uh, let's, uh, let's remember though, there are some risks with this investment. Why don't you run this through a couple of major ones? Okay, so the first thing, it's not really a risk, but I always encourage everyone to understand what they're getting into before they click on buy. We've already touched on it. EOS is a defense business. Uh, as such, it is going to have an element of, you know, it's going to be opaque. You're going to not always know what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, finding out information about, you know, contracts that it may be out there, and it's largely going to be classified to a large degree. So it's not going to be the easiest company to wrap your head around. Also, some of its biggest businesses and biggest drivers of growth in the years ahead are very, very early stage. So this is a company that if you want a business where you like to see immediate um, kind of impact and, uh, you know, nice, steady price, share price appreciation, this may not be one for you because it's going to be a bumpy and, like I said, opaque kind of ride. Um, mm. But like I said that's what that's just part of investing. So I encourage everyone if you do invest in electro optic systems, you kind of need to really, really have that long term view because, uh, like I said, SpaceLink, you know, one of its biggest, uh, you know, one of its biggest focuses at the moment. That's not even going to. That's not even forecast to generate any revenue until 2024. In the meantime, they're going to be spending money to get to get that ready. Mm. It still has to be launched into space. Mm. Not the you know not the the li a, a risky thing because hey rockets blow up sometimes. Um, yeah. So this is going to be a long term business and a true long term business, not one of these. I'm a long-term investor, but I want to see results now kind of investments. Mm. Uh, so there's that. That's the preamble. Um, as for actual risks, uh, again, defense business, it can only sell to certain governments and certain militaries because they're not going to allow them to be sold to other countries. And obviously, the US is the big dog in that fight. So you're kind of at the whims of the, of the US military. Um, also, implies a lot of work with governments. And although governments have been increasing the amount of money they spent on defense, all it needs is an, is an election and things can change very quickly. Uh, need I say submarines and France and everything that's been going on recently regarding that. Um, so there's a lot of regulatory government type of risk, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so... Also, we've also seen some recent delays with COVID uh, that stopped them from fulfilling orders and being able to, you know, to get revenue in timeframes and that had to be postponed to future periods. Um, you know, that's been impacting short-term performance. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a long-term issue, but it, again, it just shows when you're dealing with a concentrated, um, a concentrated customer base, when something goes wrong, even if it's not your fault, it's going to impact your results. And I think that's largely allowed me to see this as an opportunity right now because I think it is at prices not that far away from its 52-week uh, low at the moment. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of, uh, you know, there's always going to be that, uh, you know, it's going to need to execute on its contracts and get them done by timelines. And, uh, you know, again, defense defense contracts are not simple things. There's, you know, things can blow out and quite often do. So all of these put together just highlights, this is, this is, a, this is a risky company to invest in. Um, you know, and you do need to kind of just trust that the company can keep uh, operating the way that it has 
but a lot of things can go wrong largely because of its nature as a defense business. So that's generally the, uh, to sum up the risks. And unfortunately, Mm. a lot of them probably are outside of EOS's control. So a high return potential business, but also potentially a pretty risky business. And again, maybe maybe neither, maybe both, depending on how circumstances play out. But there's a big range of outcomes. You're pretty comfortable, though, that on balance, you think it's more likely to be a market beater than a market lagger. That's why it's a buy recommendation of ours. That's the benchmark that we set ourselves with our services, or by one, which is a different service. But the rest of them are set to be market beaters. Otherwise, hey, buy the index. And that's what Andrew's trying to do, is give you today one of those market-beating investment ideas he's looking for. Mate, you've done a great job summarizing the bull and the risks. Thank you, a bull case and the risks. Thank you for doing that. Uh, you know what's coming next, mate. Our viewers and listeners know what's coming next. It is the 60-second elevator pitches. We go from the first floor to the 31st. Convince me that I should buy shares in EOS. Okay, so EOS is, I think, one of the most innovative businesses on the ASX. It's It, it is operating in a very... In, in a market where there's a lot of high barriers to entry and it already has an entrenched, entrenched place in that market. Now, it's also targeting some really exciting opportunities in the year ahead, which if it can continue executing like it has in the past, means that it should hopefully become very lucrative businesses in their own right. And if they do, then I think it's worth significantly more than what it's worth right now. Beautiful. Nicely done, Andrew Leggett. What's left for me to say is space. Final Frontier. I've always wanted to say that. Now I get to say it on video and podcast now, Les. Mate, thank you for spending some time with us talking through EOS and the investment case there. A pretty exciting potential opportunity there for investors who have a bit more appetite for risk and volatility. But one, as you say, you expect will pay off over the long term for those investors who can stay the course and let those trends, those opportunities play themselves out. Phil, thank you for spending a bit of time with Andrew and I. On behalf of Andrew, myself and the whole Motley Fool team, until next time, fool on. <laughs>